Hi, shalom, friends. There was a, uh, a young boy, or maybe young man, 14, 15 years old. He was studying in a, an advanced academy in Israel, where primarily the main subject is advanced Talmud, and he was really challenged. It was not easy. It was a very long day. And in addition to that, he had a very difficult upbringing. He was uh, orphaned from his father at the age of six, his mother barely held on to the family. And from all sides, he, he just was beset with the issues. One day, in despair, he meets with his rabbi on a personal level. And he says, Rabbi, am I, am I a bad person? And of course, the rabbi looks at him, what? He said, why is God doing this to me? I'm in a class. Everyone seems to be well-adjusted. They enjoy their studies, they have a home to go to, they have fathers and mothers, and they have siblings. It's, it's, it's normal. And I, I don't have any of that. And after the rabbi spoke to him for a while, he left him with the following parable. He told him, he says, you know, if you want to travel from point A to point B on a highway, would you take a tank? Of course not. Tank goes slowly. It's very cramped, very, very uncomfortable. You take a car. So you have speed, you have comfort, maybe even beauty. But what happens if you have to uh, go from point A to point B, not on a highway, but to travel over boulders, hills, ravines, crevices? Would you take a car? As soon as it hits the first boulder, it would be stuck. If you got it out of the boulder, it would go into a rut. But a tank, tank will go over all of those obstacles. He told them, he said, life in many ways is a life that's strewn with boulders, hills, crevices, ravines, all kinds of stuff. People that often grow up charmed, they're living a life of a car. They're on the highway. But as soon as they reach an obstacle, they're stymied, they're held back, they're distressed, and it's, it's, it's very, very um, debilitating for them. But people who grow up with the struggles that you're growing up with, you're developing the resources and the strength you need. Yes, now it's cramped, it's slow, it's tedious, but you are a tank you will be able to continue your life on a strong, solid basis. I read this, I thought it was a very moving parable, and I could certainly see it in terms of Jewish history. When we look at Jewish history over thousands of years, and our history is very different than other histories of other nations, and we see how much, how many obstacles even suffering and persecution we went through. And yet, we developed and continue to strengthen ourselves. We're tanks. Nothing can stop us. It's inevitable. We are marching, we are progressing, and we are anticipating the destination of a full land of Israel filled with happy, healthy people and a world that will be blessed with peace and instruction from the Mashiach himself. This week in the Torah portion, there's an, quite an, uh, an interesting story. Actually, it's remarkable. <clears throat> it's a story about a man who's spiritually gifted. He knows the occult. He's proficient with the black arts, what they say it. But he's also a receptacle. He receives heavenly instructions. And a man as spiritually gifted, a master, with all of these wonderful qualities, was thoroughly evil. He used all of his gifts for one purpose only, to enhance his ego, his, himself. And this was expressed in two ways. He desired and ran after honor. He desired and ran after wealth. <clears throat> so the story begins that the Jewish people are on, marching on their way to the promised land. And there is a king 
who the Jewish people, they will pass next to his country. They're not even gonna go into his country, but this king is anxious. So he, he wants some type of hex, some type of a curse to be put on these people, the Hebrews. So he hires this wicked man, and I'll give you his name, Bilam, a very, very corrupt, evil person who has incredible spiritual gifts that he is abusing. So the story continues, and I'll accelerate it. He's on his way to this king to curse God's chosen people, and God sends him a messenger in the form of an angel to tell him, desist. Don't do this. This is not good for you, and it will not bring you honor or wealth. And this man, Bilam, does not see the angel, but the animal that he's riding on, which happens to be a donkey, does. And this angel is there with a sword, so the donkey stops. Bilam, on his way to curse the Jews, the Hebrews, uh, is, gets very upset. He hits the donkey. Get up, donkey. Let's continue. And they go a little bit further, and the donkey not only sits, but actually pushes this man against the wall, hurting his foot. Now he's irate and angry. He, he beats the donkey. Get up, you donkey. I'm on my way to curse the Jews. And finally, they go another couple of steps, and the donkey seeing an angel with a sword just simply to save the life of his master stops and sits and now he hits him a third time and then god opens up the mouth of the donkey and says to the man bilam why are you hitting me have i ever been disloyal to you i saved your life and then god opens up the eyes of Bilam and he sees this angel. Okay, now let's just stop over here. Here's a person who has spiritual insight. If you were to see an angel with a sword, would you continue on the journey? Or would you get the message that maybe God doesn't want me to do this? And yet, this very astute person didn't get the message, continues on his way. Of course, there's much I'm leaving out of the story. But what I want to share with you is when you're fixated on something and you're emotionally involved, even a miracle doesn't talk to you. Even an overt message would not talk to you. If you want to go somewhere and you might get a text telling you, do not go there. And this text is from a best friend. This text is from someone you trust. But if you really want to go, you'll say, ah, I'll go. So God gives us these struggles to make us stronger so we can become resilient, and not only resilient, but we might re receive extra powers to overcome any type of obstacle in the future, and sometimes we refuse to acknowledge it. So I will conclude with a final story. There was a very, very talented teacher, I think in the Gera Yeshiva, his, I, his first name was Gedalia. They called him Reb Gidl. This Reb Gidl was an inspirational figure for hundreds and hundreds of students. What was the inspiration? Not only was he a Torah scholar, not only was he almost always in a really pleasant mood, but what he went through in his life is unheard of at least to these young boys in the 1970s and 1980s in Israel. He had lived through the concentration camps. He only had one daughter. She was murdered by the Nazis. He himself had suffered, I don't know, for two years or three years, inhuman, hellish conditions. And he comes out with his faith, with his humor, 
with his personality intact. So once he's teaching a class, and one of the students says, Reb Gidl, how could it be that you went through all of your suffering with your faith intact, and so many others lost it? It was a hot day, and there was a water bottle on the desk. So he unscrewed the cap in front of all of the boys, put it into his finger, and into his palm. He said, I'll answer you. If I were to invite someone to the room to find the bottle cap, what are the chances of them finding it? And of course, they had to acknowledge close to zero because they'd be looking up and down in all of the desks. It wouldn't even occur to them that Reb Giddel is holding it in his hands. But he said, you saw what just happened. If I asked you to identify where is the battle cap, would you have to spend hours looking? No, it's clear, the, the rabbi's holding it. He said the same thing was with faith. Many people that came into the camps, their faith was somewhat shaky to begin with. And when they were living under such terrible, horrible conditions, they began looking, where's God? Looking for faith. And in a place of such utter darkness, they couldn't find it. So it's no wonder and no one can blame them for losing it. But when I went into the camp, I, was, I had faith. All I had to do was hold on to it. And at the times of duress, when I felt that I was losing it, then imagine a dark room. If you're, and I tell you, look for a diamond ring, you're gonna flounder. But if you were holding the diamond ring and you dropped it, you know what's there. So you get on all fours and you begin tapping the floor until you find it. So certainly it was not easy. And certainly it is not easy now either. But I went in with faith, I held on to my faith, and I continue with my faith. And that's what I'd like to leave with you. We're tanks, we're strong, we're powerful, we've lived through everything. Our faith should be intact, should remain intact. In fact, it should be strengthened from day to day. It becomes clearer to us that there is a God, there is a plan. What used to be considered security and rational thought does not exist in the way we were brought up. What does exist is the Torah, which is eternal, the Jewish people, which are eternal. And let's hope, and, and God, obviously, which is eternal. Let's hope and pray that the Mashiach comes very, very soon, so the entire world will shout out the truth of God is one and His name is one. Shalom.